Mr. Butler from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Good to see you again, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm George Butler, so I'm a postdoc in the Cancer Ecology Center at Johns Hopkins, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, punctual evolution in metastasis. So nothing to disclose. So when we think about models of cancer evolution, we might classically go to a gradual model, which is shown at the top here, where we've got a clone that starts off, we've got a kind of gradual diversification process as evolution ebbs and flows over time. We can see how that clonal diversity is increasing, leading to a population of cells there on the far right with a sort of vast array of different colors. Contrast though is sort of punctuated evolution, where we think of starting off with this initial clone, a big burst of diversity, followed by a period of evolutionary stasis. But why do these sort of models matter? Well, punctuated effects are important because they can affect how we end up treating different cancers. And this is very general and very broad, I admit. But the idea being that actually in gradual evolution, you've got so much diversity at the end when it's time to treat, that you want to target truncal mutations, mutations that are appearing early on in the tree that are inherited by the rest of the clones. In contrast, in a punctuated model, the clone diversity is expected to be lower. So we might look to target the clones themselves. So to kind of look and dig into some of these questions, we need a data set that is uh, vast and that has high granularity. So CRISPR-Cas9 lineage tracing is a really good tool for doing this kind of work. So this is from a published data set that has nothing to do with our group, but it's really amazing. I uh, really encourage people to read it in cell last year, where in individual mice, these are genetically modified mice, they have these CRISPR-Cas9 barcodes that track lineages over time. An important kind of consideration here being that you can have multiple lineages within a given mouse, so some lineages, as shown there in the blue, do not metastasize at all, and other lineages do metastasize around the mouse, shown there in red. So we have about 45,000 cells in total from metastatic and non-metastatic lineages, and there's 12 metastatic and 18 metastatic lineages that were collected. Okay, so this audience probably already knows this, but I'm actually sitting in a uh, basic biology kind of lab within a clinical department, so sometimes throwing up fire genetic trees can catch people out. So just a quick recap. The branches going horizontally is what we're going to refer to as our branch lengths. We've got our nodes there, and then we've got our most recent common ancestors. That's the node that precedes two descendants. Oops. But branches can also represent more, more than just this kind of basic structure. They can actually represent evolutionary change. We see this a lot in species evolution when we think about how branches and trees can increase over time. Okay, so we know that we've got this data set. We know that we can have trees and they can tell us important bits of information, but how do we actually reconstruct these trees? Well, there's a diverse array of methods and I haven't got enough time to go into them today, but I'm gonna highlight two. Maximum parsimony that's commonly used in a lot of uh, cancer biology and cell biology, and then a sort of Bayesian model-based approach used in species biology. So for anyone who's not familiar, maximum parsimony looks to find the tree that minimizes the amount of evolutionary change. That is the fewest number of changes need to occur to reproduce the data. So how can we think about that in a more abstract concepts? Well, actually that's sort of the shortest route from A to B. So if you needed to drive somewhere and you flicked open Google Maps and you get those different routes, you might take the shortest route, but you also might not. And actually, if you're a UPS driver and you always turn right, you might take that gold route that's showing around the top. Or if you wanted to avoid that tight intersection there, you might look to go fast down the sort of highway, even though it's a longer route, but it's a more efficient route. It gets you from A to B faster. Okay. So that's great. So we have all these different routes. We know how complicated cancer is. So how can we start to pick through what's the most likely um, tree or the most likely route that was taken? That's when model-based approaches come in. And specifically, we're going to talk today about some Bayesian model-based approaches. So a model-based approach defines, formally defines an underlying model of molecular evolution, specifically the rate of substitution, the frequency of substitutions, how fast you're going from A to C, A to G, and how often those nucleotides are changing. The result is the tree that's most likely uh, to be produced given, sorry, most likely to produce the observed data given the model. And as we all know in here, as sort of modelers, defining a model is often really, really hard. So how do we get around that? Well, we kind of cheat a little bit and say, let's say that we don't actually ever really know what the true model is. So rather than having a single tree, we can have a posterior of trees. So we call this phylogenetic uncertainty. And we can do this by constructing a Markov chain and sampling trees, because we know when that Markov chain is equilibrium, that's going to be most, um, it's in the region of most likely trees. So in this example here, where I've got these uh, numbers by the nodes, we're saying that actually 67 out of 98 of our trees, we have this topology, but we also have other topologies in the sample, as shown there on the far right. 
But two very specific considerations we need to think about in CRISPR is one, we've got really high um, mutation rates. That's why this works. That's why this can track individual cells because mutation rate is so artificially high. We've also got these big multi-site dependencies. That's widespread deletions that can knock out multiple sites. So we can account for the first issue by allowing those rates to speed up and slow down throughout the tree. That's known as a discrete gamma rate heterogeneity model. It's been used in species evolution now for about 30 years. Really, uh, really strong, really powerful model. We can count these multi-site dependencies by a term that we use, pattern heterogeneity. So this is where we allow qualitatively different models of evolution to emerge. So that is we fit those matrices that I showed earlier and we allow multiple different matrices to come interchangeably throughout the tree. So that produces a really sort of natural question, well, how many patterns are enough? So one way to do this is to keep reconstructing trees and then finding which tree fits the data best. But these trees take weeks, if not months, to fit. We're talking about thousands of individual cells as tips. So instead, we use a procedure known as reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo, or RJMCMC. So that allows you to simultaneously, without any prior knowledge, estimate the states of your Markov chain, but also the dimensionality. So you can actually allow that posterior dimension to change through time as the Markov chain is converging. And actually you find that when you combine both of those sort of metrics, you get a really powerful model. So shown here on the left is, so we've got the uh, log likelihood on the uh, Y axis, the number of parameters here on the X. The left is the null in purple, our gamma only in orange, our patterns only in green, and the combined in blue. So we find that actually we need to account for these heterogeneity, otherwise you get an absolutely terrible model. And when you account for both, that produces the best log likelihood, but it also minimizes the number of parameters that you need to include. That's really important when we're thinking about big trees that might have tens of thousands of cells. We don't want to throw unnecessary parameters in there. We find that approximately the number of parameters scales with the number of, um, sorry, the number of patterns scales with the number of cells in a tree, which kind of makes intuitive sense. Actually, if you've got more cells, there's probably more evolution that's merged, so you've perhaps got more complexity and these patterns going to develop. And on the right there, we've got an example of a tree with the primary tumor shown there in blue. So that's the cells there, the tips. And then you can see that sort of clay that's shunted out there to the far right. So those are the cells that have ended up into distant site metastases. In this example, that's in the lymph node. But we've got multiple different trees that show these similar patterns. Okay, so we can now reconstruct trees really well. But let's get into what I was actually talking about to begin with. How can we pick out punctuated evolution? Well, a quick phylogenetic refresher. So nodes is our sort of net speciation. That's what we refer to at a species level. But in this case, we can think of that being actually the amount of division, the cell division that's occurred. And the branch is the amount of evolutionary change. And the path then is the total amount of evolutionary change. So then we can detect or look for signal of punctuated evolution by using what is actually quite a simple method where we say path lengths, the total amount of evolution that's occurred, it's going to be equal to our gradual contribution. So that's just that Darwinian clock that's ebbing and flowing over time, plus possibly some contribution from the nodes on our tree multiplied by a punctuated effect. In a gradual tree, where we've got just this continual evolution process that's going through time, when we uh, plot those two together, we're going to have path length and node count being a completely flat line. But when we do the punctuated tree, we end up getting those two things correlated. So if you have a correlation, we know there's a punctuated effect there. And we do this across our lineages, and this is a work in progress at the moment. We've still got a lot of trees left to do. We find that actually punctuated effects are pervasive in non-metastatic lineages and metastatic. There's no significant difference between the two, which at least when we first did this was kind of surprising. Um, so we wanted to dive into this further and understand, okay, but what percent of the molecular diversity that's left in that final population is due to punctuated effects? So we can take the number of branches in our tree that have a punctuated effect, multiply that by the punctuated contribution, and then divide that by the total amount of evolution that's occurred. That gives our punctuated contribution. We find that again, take this with a grain of salt, we've still got a lot more trees to um, reconstruct, but the punctuated contribution is actually relatively similar. It bubbles around about 7%. For both are non-metastatic and metastatic. And again, when we think of mechanisms that can drive punctuated evolution, this sort of surprised us because two of those mechanisms can be founder effects that we spoke about earlier or niche invasion. So we might think actually if something that's metastasized that's moving into a new niche, we'd expect to see a bigger punctuated contribution. But we have to remember that in those metastatic lineages, we've also got the primary cells and our metastatic ones. So we need to be able to pull these two types apart. And we can do that by using a method of ancestral state reconstruction. So that's where we take where the cells have ended up in the tips we wind the clock back. 
So we go back in time and start reconstructing those internal nodes of the tree across our whole posterior distribution, accounting for that uncertainty in the shape or topology of the tree, and then identify branches that are primary tumor branches or distant site metastasis branches. We also have these gray branches here, which are branches that we refer to as transitions. That's where you move from the primary to the met or the met back to the primary. When we do this, we actually find that the punct rate contribution, so when we just look at those branches that are in METs versus in primary, is much, much higher. So we've got the four metastatic lineages here. Just uh, to make everyone aware, that lineage four is exactly the same as the other ones. It's just on a much higher scale. We find that there's significantly more punct rate of contribution in our metastatic sites, which again, is somewhat intuitive, but it's, we were quite surprised at how clearly this comes out from the data. And these, there's an array of different metastatic sites here. So we've got lymph nodes, We've got uh, liver, we've got ribs, we've got, um, yeah, a whole array. It's a really great data set to mine. So that's a kind of whistle-stop tour, but just to summarize, punctuated effects are pervasive, and that's important when we want to think about dating phylogenetic trees and working out how phylogenetic trees relate to treatment strategies. We need to account for these punctuated effects. The contribution is similar to molecular diversity, but actually the effects are much higher contribution in distant sites versus in the primary, which is kind of interesting if you think about that from a sort of treatment point of view. And I know sort of in the prostate world, at least there's a kind of debate about whether or not you should be treated, taking out the primary when treating METs or not. This would say actually you've got on the face of it very different evolutionary patterns that are driving each of those. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the whole lab here on the left, specifically my team mentors, Ken Pienta and Sarah Amund. Chris Venditti and Andrew Mead at the University of Reading, uh, Bob Axelrod at University of Michigan, Prostate Cancer Foundation and Department of Defense Fund Mining Work. And with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, I was, um, I'm having trouble differentiating between two explanations. Like you could have one driver or one or two drivers and then like a hundred pa hitchhiking passenger mutations, right? That might be, one way you could get um, like a uh, hundred mutations into the tree, or you could have like a evolutionary innovation where, or, or niche invasion where you have like a whole volley of adaptive variants and, or maybe there's even like uh, evolutionary tunneling. Do you think you can differentiate between those two possibilities? Um, yeah, so the short answer is that's the beauty of these methods. Once you've reconstructed the trees, because they're such a nightmare, you can then overlay any sort of quote unquote phenotypic information that you have. So this data set's got paired single cell RNA seq with it. So you can actually go through and look at like certain genes. So you could look at like MYC expression or something and go back in time and look at see whether those correspond to large molecular evolutionary events where you're seeing particular genes that are driving that. Okay. To kind of, if it's like that, kind of get at your question. Okay, so, so, you, so you're saying you can look for certain functional features of these mutations and if you see them across a wide variety of genes, then that gives you reason to believe it's a volley of adaptive events. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, so the same in sort of any comparative study at a species level, if you think in species, body mass is a good example of that. If people take body mass and they put that on there and they look for these adaptive trends that occur over time. You could do the same thing here with expression or you could do it with um, uh, copy number variants, anything on there you can pair across, but there still needs to be an underlying signal there. So if you want to find out these different modes, you need to see how those genetics are changing first. Cool, yeah. Cool. What is, the, what is the original raw data? Are you working with bulk? Uh, no, this is single cell. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so cool. it's all single cell. And the barcode sequence is about, I think it's about 300 base pairs long. And then you have somewhere between 10 and 30 of those target sequences with this, mm -hmm. within each individual cell. So you can then pull those together. And then mm -hmm. that kind of acts as your barcode tracer. And like, what's your kind of interpretation of having this kind of clean separation and the metastatic clean edges? Like, why, why do you think, what, what, what do you think is the underlying biology? Yeah, I think that is purely down to the fact that you're moving into a new site. So you actually, you could be a cell that, you know, hypothetically wasn't actually that fit in the primary because you're in the site and there's not as much competition that allows for really rapid rates to emerge. As sort of Bob was saying earlier, it allows for that cell division to happen because mm -hmm. you haven't got the competition from the other cells, which then kind of a uh, population level looks like really fast rates. Mm -hmm. I just always seem to ask the follow-up question. So the, following up on what Andrew just said, yep. um, 
Um, so you, you might have, have differences uh, of, of proliferative potential or, or competition also, not only at the farming static site, but also uh, locally, right? So being on the surface, or if you have short range dis dispersal around the primary tumor, you would also have probably a uh, proliferative advantage, uh, access to nutrients, nutrients, et cetera. And I think like one of the challenges that we always have for modeling is that really inferring kind of like what, what Sandy was saying, what about space, right? And we, we don't know how the uh, tumors grow in space. And in order to guide those models, we kind of have to measure how, what, what the growth mode is of actual tumors. And could your approach somehow pick up those fingerprints and kind of guide, okay, how is, uh, how is the, the, the spatial distribution of these growth factors um, in, in, in the tree structure? And maybe you're familiar with some of the, the work of Alston Federer, who's, the, who's trying also to you know, look at tree architectures and, and infer growth modes. Do you think that would be possible with your approach? So I think it would be with this data set, I don't think necessarily it would, but what's so, at least in my opinion, so great about this approach is that it's agnostic to the sort of data type you're feeding in. So you can imagine if you had a spatial transcriptomic data set um, and there's some sort of big data sets now in the prostate field that are coming out of uh, Norway, I think it is, where they're taking slices and doing sort of spatial RNA sequencing, mm -hmm. you could actually start to infer and pick those sort of same details up. So the group in Reading that I'm working with have done something similar looking at uh, historic dinosaur patterns and how they kind of emerged around the globe over time and how you can start to piece those ecology features together because if we're thinking about growth factors in a tumor that's very similar to thinking about uh, water locations or something or how Pangaea broke up so the methods are designed to be able to count that in it's just we need to get hold of the data thanks 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 thank you cheers